Are you serious? Are you serious, folks? Welcome to another great broadcast here at the Coming Apocalypse. And certainly, you're in for a treat. This is a, it's a great honor that we have uh, from Harvard University, Professor Avi Loeb. He is an astrophysicist uh, from Israel, both uh, in Israel and in the United States. Uh, he has filled many different positions and chaired different organizations and is currently even an advisor as we speak to the White House, to the President of the United States. And so it's, a, it's an honor. Tell us a little bit more about your bio, uh, uh, Professor uh, Loeb, because I think people should know your qualifications. Thank you. Well, I grew up on a farm in Israel, uh, was interested mostly in philosophy at a young age, uh, but then ended up in astrophysics uh, and uh, a tenured professorship at Harvard. Um, and sometimes I think of going back to the farm when I'm uh, uh, not very happy with uh, the way my colleagues uh, respond to some of my uh, suggestions. But um, uh, other than that, uh, I'm a, a member of uh, the President's Council, as you mentioned, of, of Advisors on Science and Technology. Uh, I'm also Chair of the Board on Physics and Astronomy of the National Academies. Uh, until recently, I was the longest serving chair of the astronomy department at Harvard. Uh, I'm also the founding director of the Black Hole Initiative, which is uh, a center at Harvard University that focuses on the study of black holes and brings together philosophers and scientists. That's quite uh, an interesting environment. Uh, and I'm also director of uh, the Institute for Theory and Computation at Harvard and uh, the chair of uh, the Breakthrough Starshot Initiative, which is uh, the first funded initiative to send a probe to the nearest star, uh, basically visit our nearest star. So far, we sent missions only within the solar system, and it would be remarkable if we were to reach another star. That is a remarkable uh, uh, bio, and... Uh I don't know why you're talking to me. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but let me just say this, Professor. It is an honor to have you here. And, of course, you got this brand new book that's out. Folks, you can pre-order it now uh, and uh, certainly get your copy. It's coming out in just a couple weeks here in January. Uh, Extraterrestrial. And this is an incredible uh, information here as uh, you're an astrophysicist. Let's let's go. Let's let's talk about several things. We want to talk about Mua Mua coming through that interstellar object. But uh, before we even get there, you just said something. And, and besides setting up the foundation or the, uh, uh, the the research of the black hole, the fact that you said you're searching for the planet. I take it the binary system. Are you referring to what we call Planet X or Nibiru or Planet Number Nine? Is is are you searching for this elusive planet? Well, Planet Nine is within the solar system, and it's suspected to exist in the outskirts. We haven't found it yet. We just suspect that it may be out there based on an the influence that it has on other objects that we have seen already. So um, it's still work in progress res with respect to Planet Nine. What I was referring to is visiting the nearest star. It's called the, uh, it's actually three stars in a system called Alpha Centauri. And the nearest among them is Proxima Centauri. It's about four and a quarter light years away. So it takes light four years and a few months to get to us from that star. And that means that the signal about the previous election, the 2016 election, will reach Proxima Centauri only in February 2021. You know, it hasn't reached there yet. Uh, it takes a long time to travel between stars. Even the nearest star, you know, is, is so far away. And uh, uh, if we ever want to send a probe that will get there uh, in our lifetime, uh, it needs to move at a fraction of the speed of light. And that's the challenge of this project that I'm involved in. But uh, if we were to send uh, you know, the standard rockets that we have sent so far, it will take them 50,000 years to reach what? the nearest star. And that's you know, the time that elapsed since the first humans left Africa. 
So if we wanted to reach there today, we should have sent the rocket when the first humans left Africa, which obviously we couldn't have done. So the only way we're going to be able to get a probe to this star is to come up with zero energy uh, or, or, or some kind of from Tesla. I mean, we're going to, have to come up with something that's uh, beyond our comprehension or something maybe that's from a more extraterrestrial world. Let, let's talk. Oh, go ahead. I was asked to come up with a suggestion about the technology we might use to do that. And then. Basically, an entrepreneur from Silicon Valley came to my office at Harvard. His name is Yuri Milner, and uh, unexpectedly suggested to me to explore the feasibility of doing that. And after six months, uh, you know, looking into that with my students and postdocs, we came to the conclusion that there is only one technology that can accomplish this task, and that is light sails. So uh, you are familiar with sails on a sailboat that uh, are being pushed by wind. Uh, but you can imagine a similar uh, approach using a sail in space that is pushed by light. So when light bounces off it, it gives it a little kick. And the, the idea was that uh, you use a very powerful laser beam uh, to push on a sail that is very lightweight, that weighs less than a gram. And you can equip that sail with uh, uh, electronics, uh, just like we have in a cell phone um, it, that weighs less than a gram. Maybe you can put a camera, navigation device, communication device, and all of that would weigh less than a gram. And then you push it with, with a very powerful laser to a fraction of the speed of flight. And you can do that um, with existing technology just developed for that purpose. And that's the project that we have called Starshot. So the idea is to use a light sail. That is fascinating. That sounds like almost like CERN, because I know that when they collide the protons there in the collider, that they actually get it traveling about almost the speed of light. But you're saying, is that a similar? That's true, but, but the difference is that in a collider, you have just individual particles that reach close to the speed of light. Whereas here, we want to launch a, 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 an object a, you know, that is made of a lot of particles, an object that has electronics in it. Uh, and that would be the first step for us to reach to the stars. You know, the, uh, we, we currently, you know, we have traveled through the solar system. We were born on a planet, the Earth. All of our eggs are in one basket right now here on Earth, you know, and at some point we might want to venture into space and reach the stars. And this is the first project that is funded to develop the technology that would allow us to do that. This is just fascinating, folks. It's uh, Professor Avi Loeb with us, his brand new book out, Extraterrestrial. And uh, let's talk about something. Um, Okay, I was fascinated a couple years ago when Mua Mua uh, came s speeding through our our solar system, and uh, even people online were saying, "Is that a spaceship?" Because it's not acting right. And I thought, "Oh no, that's just folks just trying to you know bring some hype." But I understand that you've been studying this uh, object for some time. And you uh, mathematically are saying it did not act like um, an asteroid or meteorite or a normal object flying through space. That's right. So back in uh, 2017, on October 19th, uh, um, the first object that came close to Earth from outside the solar system was discovered. And it's called interstellar because it was not bound to the sun. It was not part of the solar system. It just entered the solar system from outside. And that was the first object of this type that we discovered. Uh, and the uh, astronomers monitored it. Of course, the first guess was that it's just a rock, uh, like all the rocks that we found in the solar system, all the asteroids or comets. Comets are just icy rocks. They have 
ice on their surface and when they come close to the sun the ice gets evaporated by the sun it gets warmed up and uh, evaporates and and then you get a cometary tail that's what we see as comets so people immediately suspected maybe it's a comet most likely it's a comet but then there was no cometary tail detected for, around this object and astronomers used the the most sensitive telescope to look for that uh, and couldn't see it. Uh, the Spitzer Space Telescope couldn't detect any evidence for dust or carbon-based molecules that are usually coming in, in a cometary tail. And so it's not a comet. So then people said, okay, it may be a rock just without any ice on it, uh, an asteroid. Uh, the problem is that this object did not move like an asteroid, like bare rock, uh, it was actually pushed by some extra force in addition to the sun's gravity. And the question was, what is that extra force? What provides this extra push? Usually in comets, you get an extra push from the evaporated ices. So they produce a rocket effect. So when you evaporate an object, there is a push given to the object from the gases that evaporate, just like in a jet plane or uh, in a rocket. That's exactly what pushes the rocket. The, the gases that move to the opposite direction push the rocket uh, up front. Uh, but there was no evidence for such a rocket effect. There was no cometary tail. So the question, it was very puzzling. What is producing the extra push? And there were many other peculiar facts about this object. First, it, uh, as it was spinning around every eight hours, as it was tumbling, uh, the brightness of the object changed by a factor of 10. And that's unheard of in the context of comets or asteroids. Usually they vary by a factor of two. The, a change by a factor of 10, 10, tenfold, means that the area of the object on the sky, projected on the sky, changed by a factor of 10 as it was spinning around. We basically see reflected sunlight from the object. So that meant that the object is at least 10 times longer than it is wide. Even if you take a piece of paper that is razor thin, you know, and you project it uh, at random, it will never be exactly edge on. So if you imagine this piece of paper tumbling around, uh, a change in the amount of area that you see by a factor of 10 is a lot. It means that this object has an extreme geometry, very unusual. Uh, it also came from a special uh, frame of reference. It was more or less at rest uh, in uh, the galaxy, in, in the local frame where you average the motions of all the stars. And it's just that the sun, the solar system was bumping into it, just like a giant ship that is bumping against the buoy that is sitting at rest on the surface of the ocean. Uh, and also, the object was quite shiny, uh, more than a typical rock. Uh, we didn't detect any heat coming off it, and that implied that it's rather small, and um, therefore more shiny than a typical rock. So you have a very elongated, shiny object that is not showing any cometary detail. And we suggested in a paper that we wrote uh, with my postdoc, Shmuel Biali, we said, maybe it's a light sail, you know, exactly the same technology that I mentioned before. Maybe it's a light sail that is pushed by sunlight bouncing off it. And in that case, it must have been produced artificially because nature does not produce light sails. And it came from outside the solar system. We exist in the solar system. But there needs to be another civilization what? out there if indeed this looks, this is a light sail. Now, we didn't take a photograph of this object. We don't know exactly what it is, but it's a very weird object. And we should look for more of, of the same. Uh, we cannot chase it because it was discovered when it was already moving out away from us. So it's sort of like a guest that came for dinner. And then we realize this guest looks really strange. And then this guest was already on the way out into the dark street by the time that we recognized how weird that guest was. And so uh, what we need to do is in the future, check more carefully for objects like it. 
you know, when I, I go on vacation, I enjoy going to a beach and I usually look at the seashells that are on the beach and they are naturally produced and, you know, they have different colors. That they are beautiful, produced by nature. But every now and then I come across a plastic bottle, something that was produced by civilization, like our civilization. And it may well be that Oumuamua is that plastic bottle. It's a message in a bottle that is very different from all the rocks that we have seen before. This is a fascinating information. Folks, this is Professor Avi Loeb uh, from Harvard University and is an advisor, of a scientific advisor to the White House. Uh, he's from Israel and he's an astrophysicist for Israel and the United States involved in a lot of projects. This is incredible information because what you did was and what you're saying is that you have undeniable proof that this object flying through the heavens, crossing through our solar system, is being propelled by a, a not a, from an uh, uh, something other than just normal. I should say it's not the sunlight, but it's actually being managed by some type of organic uh, life of intelligence. You're saying there's another intelligent civilization somewhere out there guiding this this object, and if they can do that, it, is that what you're saying? Yeah. The, the, the potentially i mean i'm not saying there is a proof because we haven't taken a photograph of this particular object but it looks very weird and potentially it could have been produced artificially by another civilization so it may be a piece of technology and uh, you know it's a different way for finding evidence for another civilization in the past over the past 70 years we've been searching for radio signals from space as soon as we developed radio communication, we thought maybe, you know, there are signals coming from other civilizations. We haven't detected any evidence for that. But this is more like a message in a bottle. It's a, a physical object that is visiting the solar system. Actually, it's the first physical object from outside the solar system that we detected. And it may be indicative of an alien technology. And if so, you know, it will have profound implications for the way we think about ourselves, because it will change our perspective about our place in the universe. And perhaps we are not alone. You know, the first question is, are we alone? And maybe we are not. And of course, the second question that I have is, are we the smartest kid on the block? Uh, I, you know, when I read the morning newspaper, I, I always have the sense that we are not particularly smart, you know, because we're fighting each other, we're trying, uh, you know, we're wasting a lot of energy uh, in disputes and uh, we're not working together. And uh, uh, that, that is lack of intelligence in some sense, because uh, I think collaboration and working together and trying to understand each other uh, is a sign of intelligence. You're trying to, to go to, towards a, a better future. And so it's quite possible that there are uh, civilizations out there that are much more intelligent than we are, much more mature. You know, when, when my daughters were young, they tended to think that they're at the center of the world, that, you know, they are uh, the center of attention. But when they grew up and they went out to the street, uh, they met, met other kids and then they matured. They, they recognized they got a better perspective about their place. And um, our civilization, we, are not mature yet. We, some of us think that, you know, we are at the center of the world. And in fact, you know, for many uh, millennia, humans thought that we are at the center of the universe. Uh, we are not, maybe. And one way to find out is to find evidence for others out there. And then we, we could potentially learn important lessons from these others. And, you know, for example, if, they, if, if we find evidence for a dead civilization, civilization that does not exist anymore, you know, that we can find evidence for just, just like we, when we do archaeology, we, we dig into the ground and find evidence for ancient civilizations that are not around anymore. An example is Ma the Mayan civilization in Mexico. Uh, uh, you know, you find evidence for something that existed in the past, but doesn't. 
anymore. And, and the same can, you can do in space. You can find objects that represent civilizations that are not around anymore, artifacts. And if you do find that, it would be interesting to understand why they don't exist anymore. Perhaps that will teach us a lesson to get our act together and, and behave better so that we will survive for longer, unlike those civilizations. This is a fascinating concept, but it does force us to think outside the box. And of course, I'm a pastor. So obviously, we take a look and, and ha humanity has for a long time looked at the Bible and said, OK, you know, uh, mankind's been here maybe 6,000 years. And then we start thinking about other things in the scriptures like Cain went and married his wife in the land of Nod. Well, who were those people? OK, and then you start you start getting outside your area and what you're saying is for a long time we here on planet earth thought we were the the you know that we're we're it okay but why in the world would god create us a vast absolutely vast insanely and i don't even know how many universes there are solar systems we don't know so what would make us think that this one little rock from third rock from this one sun is it i think that what you're doing is broadening our minds based on scientific factual findings that something else intelligent is out there creating or guiding or as you call it light sail technology let's let me ask you a question there's a star let me, let me, before you ask the question let me just say that I agree with you. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I, I just wanted to emphasize that I think, personally, science is not in conflict with religion. I, I do think that uh, by uh, learning through science, you appreciate actually what, uh, the universe much more. So if you have a religious belief about the origin of the universe and how things came to exist, by studying it, uh, you can get a better appreciation of what it contains. It's just like having a watch, you know, on your hand. And, you know, you can live with that watch and just, you know, look at it from a distance. But if you look at it closely and start to open it up and, and, and see what's inside, you get a better appreciation for the watchmaker, for whatever made that watch. And it, in my mind, just looking at things without thinking about them is stay, you know, staying ignorant about the details that could be extremely uh, impressive you know, about the universe. And studying it through science allows us to appreciate how subtle and how uh, rich the universe is. And you know, so humans, just like my daughters, as I mentioned before, you know, they tended to think that they're at the center, that every, you know, that we are, that the universe is us, so to speak, or centered on us. But now with modern science, we can get a better perspective and get a fuller picture uh, of what's out there. It's just, allow, I think it would allow us to appreciate better uh, how wonderful reality is, and rather than being conflict. The way, the way that it's usually portrayed is that science is in conflict, you know, and, and I think that's a, 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 the wrong way of looking at it. Yeah, I agree with you, Professor, that I'm so glad you brought this up because it's not an either or. And I think that's been part of the problem, not only in the religious community where it's it's their way or no way. And I, and I can say that, of course, being a theologian and and in the religious community. But at the same time, it, it also can't be a scientific only Okay, ignoring right. the existence of an intelligent design, an intelligent designer, uh, the most awesome master mathematician that's ever <laughs> we'll ever understand. So, to what, your uh, what I would say is that you know that there, there, there are different facets of reality. Okay, so there is the real the part that science addresses, but then you can ask, okay, where did this come from, or is there something beyond that? And you know, that's the part that theology addresses. And, uh, you know, you can have secular people that don't believe anything, you know, theological, that work on science. That's perfectly fine, you know, because that's only, you know, as far as a 
theologist, theologian is concerned, that's only part of the of the full picture. That's and people can focus on that part. But what all I'm saying is that they are complementary, and they should not be regarded as a conf- in confrontation because. If you understand the universe better, you can appreciate it better from a theological perspective. And not conversing with science about what the universe is made of is a mistake because we learn from it. We, we appreciate it better this way. I agree 100%. Folks, this 100%, I agree with you. It's good to talk to someone that understands and has the scientific understanding, the, being an astrophysicist, you know uh, that uh, what we see out here, what, what we can recognize shows the vastness of this, the, you know, the vastness of the creation is so, it proves the great creator, the Lord himself. And let me just say this, now that you've brought, wrote this book, and again, folks, this is Professor Avi Loeb, and he's written this wonderful book called extraterrestrial that's coming out and by studying the mua mua and how it's how it acted uh, way beyond anything different it's, it's not acting like a meteorite it's not like an asteroid it's not like a fireball that we see darting through our atmosphere it's not a comet it's beyond anything we've ever seen and it seems as if it's being guided by a different technology and uh let me ask you then professor um you know i think as uh, that there's we we understand that we've been studying and been listening for those radio waves but we may have been missing it right in front of us signs everywhere of um, intelligent life beyond the human race do you um, and we are genetically changing uh, obviously uh, with modified um, altering splicing of the DNA do you believe that that same concept could be also happening in space in other words is there still creating planets? Is bodies of uh, out there still in the process of creating? I know there's supernovas. I know that things explode. We had the black hole. So what is, I mean, is there still more going on? Is, the, is space itself active and still in a creating stage? Yes, uh, definitely. I, I mean, um, let me just say in a few words what the, uh, the current perspective, scientific perspective is about the universe. Basically, everything started at a point in time. There was a big bang. And then after that, uh, structure started to form in the universe. The universe is expanding. And as it expands, you know, there are regions that are slightly denser than average that collapsed upon themselves into objects like the Milky Way galaxy, our own galaxy. Then in spite of it, uh, the gas fragmented into stars like the sun. So the sun is a relatively late bloomer. Uh, it formed at the tail end of the star formation history of stars in the universe. But there are still other stars forming just right now. We see them. We see gas clouds fragmenting into stars, some of which are just like the sun. And they're just being born right now. There are beautiful images of stars being born, you know, and coming out, out of the gas. Uh, and and the, that explains to us how the sun came to exist. Now, all the planets like the Earth, uh, they were made out of the debris that was left behind from the formation process of the sun. So there was just some debris left and in, in a disk around the star was orbiting around and, and then rocks were assembling out of that and they collided to make the Earth, for example. That's one planet and then all the other planets as well in the solar system. So we are sitting on the surface of a piece of rock, a rock left over from the debris uh, during the formation process of the sun. And there are many stars being formed right now. Now, one thing I wanted to mention, you know, humans, um, according to the current evidence that we have, you know, started uh, uh, in, 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 in uh, uh, Africa and, and then migrated to other places. And of course, uh, you know, the, the, the conditions right now in an apartment building in the Bronx, you know, are very different than uh, the conditions that the first humans 
uh, experienced, but we accommodated, we adapted to, to, to changing circumstances. We can live in a in a big city like New York City uh, when you know just a uh, hundred thousand years ago we used to live uh, in the wild and. Uh, if you ask what will the future hold for humanity, uh, if we move into space, you know, it's quite possible that we would live in a platforming space or on some other planet like Mars or, you know, or just a, on a, f a floating platform. And even though it sounds uh, very futuristic right now, uh, humans can adapt to a new, uh, completely different circumstances and, you know, the conditions on Earth, this rock that we are living on right now, the conditions may deteriorate in the long term. And, uh, for example, there used to be dinosaurs around. They were killed by a, a big rock that uh, impacted the Earth. Uh, and so if another big rock hits the Earth, you know, we could be doomed to perish. And uh, that's why I think we should consider, you know, uh, spreading our eggs, not just leaving them on one, in one basket or here on earth. It would be very similar to the Bible, you know, when uh, the Gutenberg printing press was invented. Um, he, uh, that changed the idea of just having very few copies of the Bible uh, handwritten, because then each of them was very precious. But once the printing press appeared, you could make many duplicates of the Bible. And, and then if something bad happens to one of them, it's not such a tragedy because there were other copies. And the same you can imagine for the human, for humanity. You know, if, if we didn't just live on this planet here on Earth, then we wouldn't be as vulnerable to a catastrophe. Uh, right now, Everything that is precious to us is here on Earth. And if something bad happens to Earth, then we are doomed. But if you spread, you, you have a, a representation of, of, you know, of humanity on, on other objects, then uh, something will survive and maintain the human race in the long term. And, uh, professor, I have to ask you, I've been studying the asteroid Apophis it's known as the God of Chaos, that's apparently going to go past the Earth on Friday the 13th, April the 13th, 2029. Now, uh, at first, I know NASA, when they first identified this back in 2004, they said there was about a 2.7% chance that it could hit the Earth. They've since calculated, since it's gotten closer, and said, well, eh, maybe it's, we got a better percentage chance. But it does seem that there's a lot of interest uh, from governments of the world to prepare for incoming asteroids and for deep impacts, uh, even to the point that I know that governments build underground cities and, 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 and they're preparing for something. May I ask you, you're an astrophysicist. Have you studied Apophis and, um, and it's going to have come back seven years later if it doesn't hit us the first time? Is there concerns in the scientific community in the, as an astrophysicist of about about not only this asteroid, but any others that you guys may know about that maybe the public doesn't? Yeah, definitely. And in fact, the, the telescope that discovered Oumuamua, pan stars in Hawaii, and I should say that Oumuamua means a scout in the Hawaiian language, that, that this object, Oumuamua, was discovered by a telescope in Hawaii and in uh, October 2017. I actually visited that mountain where the telescope is, Haleakala Mountain, uh, in Maui, Hawaii, uh, just uh, a few months before the object was discovered in July 2017. And uh, the point is that um, uh, this telescope was uh, built and funded in order to find those dangerous uh, uh, asteroids that could hit the Earth and cause damage. Um, and if we can identify them, if we scan the sky and, and find all the dangerous objects, bigger than uh, about 140 meters or so, if we find them, then perhaps we can have a plan. By the time they get close to Earth, we might find a way of deflecting them. So we are smarter than the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs did not have science, did not have astronomy. They just looked up at the sky and they saw this big rock 
approaching them and smashing on earth and then they die uh, humans have science have astronomers and we can once we recognize that the an object is heading our way that is big enough to cause a catastrophe, we can develop a, a, a way of deflecting it. You don't need to deflect it by a lot. Just nudge it a little bit, and then it will not cross the path of the Earth. And uh, there are plans uh, of doing that once we find dangerous uh, objects. Uh, is there, and, plans, uh, is there yeah. plans right now to deal with Apophis? I mean... Uh, you're, you're, you're a consultant to the White House, and uh, I'm sure other governments are involved. Is there a plan to deal with this one? I mean, is this a threat? This one, this one is not yet a, a high enough risk. At the moment, you know, it's uh, unlikely that it will hit the Earth. Uh, but as time goes on, we collect more and more data on this object or other objects. And if it will become clear that one of the one of them is heading our way and definitely will hit the earth and it's a big enough object to cause uh, concern then the, uh, definitely there would be a plan uh, to deflect it and uh, there are various uh, technologies that are being imagined of how to deflect it you know you can shine a, a laser on it and evaporate uh, uh, the ices, for example, if it has ices or, or material on one side so that to give it a nudge uh, and then it will not hit the earth. Um, some people suggested uh, painting it on one side so that it will reflect the sunlight differently and uh, as a result get deflected. Of course, there are the more uh, uh, Hollywood uh, proposals that uh, talk about uh, blasting it, uh, you know, with with a, a nuclear weapon or something, which doesn't really make a lot of sense because then you create a lot of fragments and you increase the chance of one of the fragments uh, intercepting the Earth. So there are ways to uh, avoid such a catastrophe, but we need to know what is coming our way. And to do that, we need to use telescopes like Pan Stars to survey the sky. In about three years, there would be an even better survey called LSST, on the Vera Rubin Observatory. It will be a very sensitive survey of the sky. And hopefully, um, within five years from now, we will have a very good census of all the dangerous objects. Uh, Professor Loeb, I've, I'm really fascinated by this. And so I'm glad to hear that there's more telescopes coming and more information could be gathered and that there is contingency plans and and uh, to deflect uh any hazardous asteroid coming our way uh, let's talk about mars and now you just for a second and i want to come back to the big question again about what kind of intelligence individual type of civilization could make mua mua but i know elon musk is you know big in the news right now uh, spacex uh, wanting to build a colony. I think he's already chosen 100 people. They're going to start sending them soon. What is your understanding about that, about the colony on Mars? And uh, do you think there will be people in pods on Mars before this decade is over? Well, first of all, I should mention that the, about a month ago, uh, I took part in a debate about the space race. And the question that was posed to the panel uh, was, uh, is the space race between the US and China good for humanity? And uh, the other debaters focused on the military concerns. They worried that, you know, going into space poses a military risk, national security risk to the US and therefore should be avoided at any cost. There should be treaties among all countries not to go into space in the way that the space race is advocating right now. Uh, but I, you know, I, I couldn't understand this argument because space is all about going far away from Earth. Uh, we live on a surface, on the two-dimensional surface of the Earth, and space is about going in the third dimension, far from Earth. If you go to Mars or you go to the stars, you know, there is no military risk on Earth. Uh, when people think about military risk, it's only from space missions that are just hovering above the Earth, uh, but 
the space race is going much farther away, like you suggested, maybe going to Mars, establishing uh, a human uh, uh, village over there, uh, or going elsewhere. Uh, and um, of course, that has nothing to do with military risk. It's mostly driven by commercial interests right now, um, related to uh, the global economy. And whatever countries agree on in treaties, would not necessarily enforce these commercial uh, interests to, to abide by the same rules. And there is no police, there is no space police that would chase uh, missions that go to places that are far from Earth. So I think that the wave of the future is actually uh, associated with going into either the Moon, Mars, or, or even more distant destinations. The question is, how long will it take? And of course, as you said, Elon Musk uh, uh, is advocating going to Mars uh, with uh, SpaceX, and there is Jeff Bezos uh, with Blue Origins. Um, yeah. The question is, what is the time scale, and, and whether we should go to the moon first uh, and test our technologies there, and only then use the moon as a, a stepping stone uh, towards going to Mars. There is a plan uh, by NASA called Artemis, a uh, successor to the Apollo uh, mission that uh, uh, took place back in the 60s, uh, early 70s, uh, to uh, have humans back to the moon uh, by in, in about four or five years. And uh, that, of course, will be uh, amazing if we go back to the moon first. Uh, in terms of getting to, to Mars, I think Elon Musk is underestimating the, the difficulties of bringing humans to Mars. In particular, you know, we are well protected here on Earth and also on the space uh, station. We are protected by the magnetic field of the Earth from very energetic particles called the cosmic rays. If you go to Mars, you're pretty much exposed to these energetic particles. And, you know, in a time scale of order a year, uh, people may die just because these very energetic particles get into their body uh, and the health hazard is quite significant and we need to come up with ways of somehow blocking these very energetic particles before we put humans there uh, and uh, you know that takes time it takes time to learn how to develop these technologies we can practice on the moon so i wouldn't be surprised is if within the next uh, couple of decades we test uh, new technologies on the moon and then perhaps but in 50 years, we go to Mars. I mean, if I had to guess, that would be the timetable. Yeah, it seems like that would be make more sense uh, to go ahead. If, if you're trying to build a colony on Mars, you, you should probably first build one on the moon and then uh, and then test out the safety mechanisms. Of course, we know that the environment on the moon is much more different than Mars, but you, you could build it what Mars's would be you would create that on the moon as a stepping stone, as you said. All right, let's let's talk about this uh, again. Mua Mua. Now, your book, Extraterrestrial, and uh, you you're convinced uh, that you are convinced that there is intelligent life form somewhere out there in the interstellar space that has different technology than we have and are intelligent. Maybe have their own world somewhere else. Doesn't let, me, let me explain this perspective uh, even beyond Oumuamua. Uh, you know, we currently know that uh, about roughly half of all the sun-like stars, stars that look like the sun, uh, of other half of them have a planet like the Earth at the right distance from the star so that liquid water can exist on the surface of that planet. So the conditions that we have here on Earth are reproduced in billions of other places just in the Milky Way galaxy. And then there are tens of billions of Milky Way-like galaxies in the universe that we observe. So, you know, if you roll the dice uh, billions of times with conditions very similar to those that are here on Earth, what's the chance that you would reproduce the same outcome? Quite high in my book. Uh, but some people prefer to believe, you know, that we are special and unique. And I find that arrogant. I think that uh, uh, cosmic modesty, being modest, 
teaches us that you know we should not pretend that we are really special and powerful you know that the, over the history of humans there were kings and emperors that conquered a small piece of land on earth and they felt very proud of themselves they were very arrogant but since there are more planets like the earth than the number of grains of sand on all beaches on earth there are more planets than that then being proud of yourself because you conquer the piece of land on earth is just like an ant hugging a single grain of sand on the landscape of a huge beach and being very proud of itself i mean that makes no sense you know there is a vast space out there that has planets with conditions similar to the earth and how dare we feel arrogant in any way i think if you study astronomy there is no way from becoming modest and humble uh simply by the fact that the universe is so big it has so many things similar to what we find here how dare we think that our planet is special that we are the only ones and that there is nothing like us out there that is a great analogy and uh, and and actually i mean you're exactly right why would we think so that we were we're it that's it but that's a narrow-minded and a really a, a very small myopic, myopic view i think and i think you're exactly right extraterrestrials uh this is the book written by professor avi Loeb. i'm going to ask a question my son wanted to ask you this i know we're running out of time but he said what about the star vega uh are we too far away uh, from this star that we could ever get a probe there? No, we could, we could reach uh, there, but uh, the goal right now, for example, of the project Stasho that I mentioned, that I chair the advisory uh, board of, uh, that objective is to go to the nearest star first. You know, and if you develop a car, uh, you want first to reach the nearest city before you go very far away. Uh, and so we want to demonstrate that we can do it with the nearest star, it will already take a couple of decades to go there, with even with the light sail technology. Uh, and then, of course, we can go to other stars. And uh, why not? Vega is one of them. Uh, it's just sending a probe, of course, not sending humans. To send humans will take much uh, bigger advance in our technology. I should say I wrote an essay just uh, last month about NOAA's uh, spaceship. Uh, basically, we are all familiar with Noach's Ark, the story in the Old Testament that talks about Noach uh, building up uh, an ark to preserve um, animals and humans um, from devastation uh, as a result of the Great Flood. Uh, his idea was to build something that will preserve uh, life on Earth given the catastrophe of a Great Flood. Uh, and you can imagine doing the same thing by going to space. You can preserve uh, what we find precious here on Earth by sending a spaceship. Uh, and, um, and the question is, do we need to put elephants, whales, birds on a spaceship? Or is there a more clever way to do that? And the answer is, with modern science, there is a clever way, and that is to have a computer with artificial intelligence and a 3D printer that could potentially reproduce life elsewhere out of the raw materials that are out there. So uh, if we ever understand how to make synthetic life, uh, you can imagine just uh, loading the information about the DNA of animals and so forth into that computer so that the, we can reproduce uh, those animals on another planet without sending them. So um, that would be remarkable. I should also mention that Noah's Ark in the Bible, uh, the, it, it, the, the, the Bible mentions, the, the Old Testament mentions specifically the dimensions of this Ark uh, that Noah built. Uh, and uh, turns out <laughs> it's very close to the dimensions of Oumuamua. I mean, by chance. What? Uh, yeah, what? it's a, it's about a four or a hundred meters in length and uh, tens of meters in width, um, so not very far. 
Just you just had to throw that one out there just to to leave all of us wondering about your book, Extraterrestrial. So in other words, Mua Mua is about the size of Noah's Ark. And uh, yeah, based on I mean the Bible is very specific yes. about the dimensions, yes. But that that is I mean, I'm a scientist. As a scientist, it's just a coincidence. I, you know, I wouldn't assign. But you can uh, interpret it any way you want. Yeah, I, I don't think I believe in coincidences. I think I will interpret it and I try to understand it. So, your book, Extraterrestrials, this is going to be a fascinating read. Folks, get a copy of this book. And, uh, and really, uh, let's expand our mind a little bit and start to understand and, and appreciate, I really appreciate the intellectual uh, abilities of um, Professor Loeb and uh, how that you, Professor, and many other great scientists out there are studying uh, our great universes. And I say that universes because I think there's multiple um, and just how precious it is and just how powerful it is. So thank you so much for coming on, being with us. We're very honored to have you and we'd love to have you back again because I know our audience is going to love what you had to say today about extraterrestrials. Well, thank you for inviting me. It has been a pleasure and I'll be glad to, to come again. Thank you very much, Professor. Again, Professor Avi Loeb. What a fascinating, fascinating man. And of course, his book, Extraterrestrial. It's available coming out in, within about a couple weeks. You can go ahead, go to Amazon and purchase it. Uh, I believe pre-order it or you can go to his website Brock you can put his website up there also uh, as he's a professor there at Harvard University and as he said he's a, he's also a um, uh, advisor to the White House and uh, many other organizations that he uh, commun communicates with it's just a ma just amazing information so we'll be back with more powerful information coming apocalypse next time.